bringing to you the best in black theater. We're so excited to have you here this evening. I'd like to thank you with a special thanks extended by the executive producer and artistic director, Dr. Mona Vaughn Scott, as well as the ancestors, her parents, Nora and Burrow Vaughn. The Black Repertory Group Board of Directors would like to thank you with a special thanks going out to our Board of Directors member, Ishmael Reed, who made this connection possible with Rome Neal through Banana Pudding Jazz and the Black Seed Project in conjunction with our health education through theater. Black Repertory Group Theater's mission is to be able to provide an opportunity for people of all races, creeds, colors, orientations, and backgrounds with a chance to experience America's rich Black cultural heritage. And now, in this 59th year, we bring to you Electric Lady, written by a dynamic brother, and I'm going to give you a little bit of Jerome Preston Bates' background. On Broadway, he was in August Wilson's Jitney, as well as Seven Guitars. Also, he was in Stick Fly, his off-Broadway with New Federal Theater and the godfather of Black Theater, Woody. He was playing opposite of Viola Davis in Seven Guitars. His TV and film include Oz, All of My Children, Law and Order, Third Watch, Lights Out, NYPD Blue, New York Undercover, Shaft, so many more. His awards include six Audelco Awards. He has been on several Law and Order shows. There's so much to commend this brother in representing Black theater and film that I'm going to now hand it over to none other than the dynamic, Mr. Jerome Preston Bates. We welcome you in our 59th season and are so honored to have you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you so, 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 so much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Mona Von Scott and Sean Von Scott, executive directors and artistic director of the Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California. So I am so honored that I was asked to bring this work of Electric Lady, still in a workshop uh, format, but we have a dynamic, exceptional cast of thespians who have lent their time and lent their talents to give voice to these words and give voice to uh, our famed brother, uh, James Marshall Hendricks. I just like to extend uh, some some uh, a salute to one of the um, black reps uh, honored uh, board of directors and participants. That's uh, Sister Jean Bowen. She's in Las Vegas now. We recognize that uh, she and her husband was a friend of Jimi Hendrix in the Air Force. Immediately upon leaving military service. She gave Jimmy a home to stay at her home, and uh, and she was quite a, a fascinating uh, representation of friendship even before he became an international star. So we thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. We thank you for that part of history that you were part of in the life of James Marshall Hendricks. So we honor with the Black Repertory Theater, Jean Bowen. I'd like to introduce to you our cast. The play, Electric Lady, The Ladies in the Life of Jimi Hendrix, The Battle for Jimmy's Soul. The Angels, Angie will be played by Gabrielle Lee. Devonse, Nazipo, Maglin, Rosalie, Sophia, Coffee, Lorin, Devin, Devin, Tavanasha, Tavanasha, Wallace, Wallace.
We'll move on. We'll move on. Monica. Monica. Ali. Ali. Harry. Harry. Fame. Jenia Lear Morgan. Also, Linda would be played by Ali Carey. And Kathy will be played by Christine Dreyer. We're honored that these artists would come together and lend of their talents. As I've said before, their credits extend to Broadway and off-Broadway, recording contracts, film, television, and they were kind enough to lend their voice and their talents to this production of Electric Lady by Jerome Preston Bates. I invite you into the world of Jimi Hendrix. I invite you into that which was an integral part of Jimi Hendrix uh, due to the absence of his mother at age 12, how he longed for that motherly figure in his life or how he longed and loved uh, women in his life. So once again, Electric Lady, thank you and enjoy. We'll, get, we'll start with a prayer. Father, we thank you for all you've done and all you're doing. We thank you for being God. We thank you for being better to us than we've been to ourselves. We pray, Lord, even now that you would bless these artists. Bring them together, Father. Guide them and keep them. Uh, give them voice to speak the words. We pray for those that may come to hear from here, West Coast to the East Coast and around the world. Let the artist's light so shine that men and women will see their works and your name will be glorified. Bless the technical director, Father. We pray we bind up any technical issue right now. We send it back to confusion and we claim victory even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and enjoy the presentation of Electric Lady. Devon say, what's good? <laughs> so Jimmy, what's up with Jimmy? Oh, well, Jimmy's good. He's about to come into what his heart desires. His gifts are about to make room for him. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. Oh, you don't have to be sure. I got him covered and he'll be okay. No, he's not, not perfect. 
but he has a perfect gift and he'll be okay. I believe I can get him, of course, and smash that perfect gift you have there. Oh, now you know I won't allow you to do that. I'm sent to protect him and guide him into what's right, what's honest and divine for him. <laughs> Jimmy longs to be free, to get into a little trouble. I believe if I give and bring him the right distractions and temptations, he'll run his course and dive into his wildest desires of pleasures and unearthly indulgences and move into a high re realization of his true self. He's solid as a rock mm. and won't fall for your scheme, schemes to destroy his life. Well, he won't know it's destruction. He'll see it as a chance to move into a higher consciousness of himself, a transition into a higher knowledge of who he can be. I'll give him a source of power that will elevate him above most human expectations. And I will pour into him the will to walk away from any distractions or whirlpool of abyss and deceptive expectations of divine power you could ever offer him. I'll make him 10 times stronger to endure and survive and therefore bypass every obstacle you may bring his way. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'm gonna tempt him with every temptation lust for power and sinful ecstasy that will become unimaginable. So alluring that he will plunge into a cocoon of pleasure and desire, sweltering with every passionate misstep, interception of his destiny dressed up in satin and silk indulgence. He wouldn't be able to withstand it, and he'll be forever in my hand, chasing in his dreams every selfish gratification known to man. <laughs> In your dream, you will. He's covered, protected, headed to a righteous place of love, peace, power, and prosperity. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Some people say I was a spiritual rock messenger guitar genius or whatever. All I know is I was trying for years to make it, you know? I played with a few soul bands, Little Richard, the Isley Brothers, Ike and Tina Turner and so forth, you know? I was really struggling. Women, some of my best friends, they helped me out a lot anyway. I hope this puts a few rumors to rest. Look, I was Jimmy's first woman, his only real first woman. I was the only true love he ever really had. You see, this happened before the fame. Yeah, that's right, back in 1963 before he became the Jimmy you guys know him as today. You see, this is the LA story and I bet you ain't never heard this one. My name is Rosalie Brooks and I was born in Eudora, Arkansas. See, my parents, they moved to Los Angeles when I was about five months old. And in my early teens, I began to pursue a career as an entertainer. I sang lead for several groups and became a regular in the Los Angeles club scene. So, okay, this one night, right? Lord, I'll never forget it as long as I live. So I'm in the club, right, with my girlfriend, Pat. So I say, Pat, Pat, you see that fine guy sitting at the club? You know, because I was a star in my own right. I had signed with a major la label and, uh, you know, the Fifth Dimension was one of their clients. So anyway, I spotted this handsome, handsome guy sitting across from me. And he was giving me the eye. So, honey, I was giving it back. Yes, it was love at first sight. Looking into his eyes, I could see that man's soul. I knew this was a very passionate man. So I says to my girlfriend, Pat, I said, you see that tall, handsome man across there? Well, I was a bit overwhelmed. So I decided I better go to the ladies room. I, I was in heat. I, 
I was at a loss for words. I was trying to regroup myself. So I reached for the door and there he was standing there staring at me. So I, I believe I heard African angels that night. I heard Gabriel playing the harp and playing the horn in heaven. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, my name is Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. The next thing I can remember was waking next, up next to him in his arms. We talked about his and my dreams and our aspirations and where he were from. And you know what? We talked about God a lot. Jimmy, Jimmy was a very spiritual man. And I remember him saying, most people in the world, they really don't believe in God. And that's why they're in the predicaments that they are today. See, God was real to Jimmy. And I believe he was on a spiritual quest for the rest of his life. Jimmy at the time was with Little Rich's band, right? He was a little frustrated because he wasn't allowed the artistic freedom that he wanted. So we decided we'd write together. I'd write the songs and he would play and I'd sing and we would have a good time. So we started writing the lyrics to a song called My Diary. And it went something like this. I know that I will never love again. I know that I will be my only friend. But if you could see, I know you would. See the love sickened image that I turned out to be. My diary, my diary. La, 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 my diary. Something like that, you know, I just want to give you a little something, something. So when we completed that song, I went to get that recording date and I called my guys, Arthur Lee. So we borrowed these cats from Major Lance's band, Big Francis, Slim, Billy Revis, and our producer provided some of the horn sessions. So some of Jimmy's first recorded guitar licks were a standout on my diary. So the second half of that cut was called the UT, it was a dance cut. And it actually hit the charts for about six weeks in LA. Jim and I, we would go for walks, long walks. He loved long walks along Hollywood Boulevard. He liked to look at the stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He liked to match his fingers with those of the many stars at the Roman Chinese Theater. I had this red convertible, right? So we would go all over LA and we'd talk about what we we're gonna be when we became rich and famous. I loved Venice Beach and so did he. So one night we were sitting in the car, right? looking up at the stars and this song called Sleepwalk by Santos and Johnny came on. He took my hand and we got out the car and we danced right there in the sand. You know, Jimmy, he, he never talked much about, about politicians, he didn't like them, but he was in touch with the world's problems and such. He had great respect for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and he wanted to someday do something for black people that would reach the magnitude of Dr. Crink's dream. Now, you gotta realize it's in the music. If we would only listen to the music, respect for God, respect for women, love for everyone, regardless of color. Jimmy loved all his brothers and sisters. Listen to that album, Cry of Love. It's all in there. You see, the Jimmy I knew was a man of love. Whoa. Out of sight. Out of sight. I, I, like, it. I, I like it. Let's get in. Nice, nice, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Come on, get in the car. Let's take it for a spin. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know LA very well, do you? No, I don't. No, I don't. Okay, well, let's just ride around and just sightsee. I know this beautiful spot near Venice Beach we can go. You like it? Oh, wow. This is nice. This I, is nice. I know you would. So what do you do for So what do you do for a living? I'm a singer. No kidding, really. No kidding, really. <laughs> yeah. I sing with a band. I sing R&B and blues, you know. Any gigs coming Any up? Any gigs coming up? Nah. We just been, uh, we've been in the studio. We've been jamming. We're trying to come out with a 45 real soon. 
I'm trying to get I'm trying to get in tune together my own stuff, you know. Yeah, you know, you gotta create your own stuff these days if you really want to make it. Yeah, little Richard. Yeah, little Richard's cool, but I gotta create. I gotta create my own scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. So where you guys playing at? I'd like to come see you. I don't know the name. I don't know the name of the club. Maybe. Hmm, Cisco, Cisco. Do you mean C Rose? C Rose Club? Yeah, it sounds about yeah, it right. sounds about right. Oh yeah, C Rose. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna check you out tomorrow night. Yeah. You know, I've been doing some writing myself, and I'd actually I'd like you to come on, come to the studio and take a look at it and tell me what you think. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh this music is real nice. Yeah, that's sleep. Yeah, that's sleep. Oh, that's so romantic. Oh, I feel like dancing. Dance, dance. Where? Where? <laughs> dancing right here. <laughs> right where? <laughs> right where? Right here in the sand. You're kidding. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Come on and join me. No thanks. No thanks. <laughs> Oh, come on, please. <laughs> I don't believe this. I don't believe this. <laughs> you see, Mr. Maurice James, it's not so bad now, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Hendrix was a blues lover, a mean mother lover. He could rock you all night. Harlem was slow, and when the blues got low, he headed to Midtown to run his own show. Yeah, that's right, Uptown Manhattan. Smooth transition, club to club. He was a new man in town. A gig here, a meal there. He played with the best around. A prayer here, he practiced everywhere, all around for that very special sound. There were lonely nights, nights without a job and days spent in a dismal trance. But he was good, possibly the best. But at the time, no one knew it. He just needed that chance. Harlem. Harlem, New York. 1963. Plain Prigio. A local, a local girlfriend, girlfriend of Jimmy. Of Jimmy. During his years, during his years in Harlem. I looked at him and I said, Boy, where are you from? <laughs> huh? And where in the hell is Seattle? Because he was kind of weird, you know? You know, I believe the first time that I saw him, he was playing in uh, Sam Cooke's band or, or was a little witcher. I don't know. But he was cute, you know? And he kind of dressed a little different and had one of those processed hairdos like uh, James Brown or Little Richard. And you know, the big ones will come through town and play the Apollo and leave. And the small ones, you know, like the little guys, the little ones, they stick around, you know. Anyway, we were hanging tight. We go to the Palm Club on 125th Street and Small's Paradise on 135th and the Baby Grand. And he played with whoever he could play with. He always played. He go to bed, he be playing. He wake up, he be playing. And I'm like, damn, man, put the guitar down and pick me up and play me. Shit, what's your problem? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cuss. Anyway, I believe he won first prize at the Apollo Theater's Little Bitcher Contest. And then he was on his way. He go on tour with Lil Richard and then he come back and hook up with the Isley brothers. And local guys, they, they be uh, asking me like, where's Jimmy? Where's Jimmy? They expect me to say that he fell off of the planet and got swallowed up by the Milky Way or something. They didn't know he was off to bigger and better things. They wouldn't let him play when he was around. They laugh at him, tell him that he was too loud or out of tune or whatever. They didn't know. They didn't have any idea that he's met up with a little Richard or the Isleys or someone who could really help him get a break, you know? 
put the icing on the fucking cake. It's just a matter of time. A matter of time. So he moved to Midtown and started playing with some cats downtown at the Cheetah Club on Broadway. And then we keep in touch. And before I knew it, I hear he's in England somewhere playing with these two Y cats. He was sweet. He'd look at you with those beautiful eyes and then he'd just stare off into the distance. He'd hold my hand and say, everything's going to be all right. We go to the movies. I should have known he was going to make it. But I had no idea that he'd be as big as he was. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> you kidding. Come on down. Be my guest. We go on about nine. I'm telling the honest to God truth thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll see you there. Ooh. These guys are lousy players. Midnight Hour and a few James Brown's tunes. And then they're finished. Not that bad. She. You just being nice. I won't be here long. I just got to get my groove going. Well, you need to. Those guys are only going to keep you in the background. They ain't ever going to let you do your thing and play how you can really play. I got so many ideas in my head for songs about love. The teen kings and queens on Mars and underwater and... A lot of good blues things about broken hearts and mended souls, about black superheroes and jazzy things. I want to play like John Coltrane played the sax, compose like Beethoven composed symphonies. I want to heal bodies like Dr. Kildare. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> There's so many things I want to do. I, I just have to get my own group, maybe 10 pieces, horns, drums, keyboard, a lead vocalist. Maybe I'll slide across the floor like James Brown. <laughs> Oh my lord, you I'm crazy. Telling you, I'm telling you, honest <laughs> man, I got so many things going on in my head. It's so hard to express them, to get them out there. I, I can get in the studio, I'll create great sounds. Mm, yeah. Well, you, you need to get with a big band who'll let you do your thing, like James Brown or Otis. Yeah. You need to get over to Motown. Motown. They can create a group around you. Yeah. And so enough of this music business. How about taking care of me? Huh? Can you put the guitar down for a minute or so? Yeah, just come and clear your mind of all those ideas. You do have a lot of music in their head, don't you? You think too much. Radio station BBC London. Well, that's hell of a story. I'd say, thanks. And next we have Linda Keith. Hi, Linda, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. So, Jimmy. Yeah. That's why we're here, right? Well, Jimmy began to hear a lot about Bob Dylan and Mike Bloomfield and some cats from England. And he was beginning to appreciate other types of music, which was influencing his playing. They played a lot down in the village, they hung out, and he liked the village because no one cared there how you played or how you dressed. Because everybody there was just experiencing things and living life, you know? He eventually started this group called Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. He played soul, blues, funk, and a few rock tunes. They played all the clubs on Bleecker Street. I remember seeing him once and he was practically assaulting the guitar. He was playing it behind his back, behind his legs. He played it with his teeth, his elbow between his legs. He got feedback by rubbing the guitar against the amps and the microphone. Wow, yeah, it was that kind of scene. You see, he played a right-handed guitar, but he played it upside down. And of course he played it with his left hand and no other cats were playing like that. 
it really got him on the scene. So by this time, he's becoming quite well known throughout the village. And a lot of people were checking him out. And contract? Oh, man, everybody was always trying to get him to sign a contract. So one day, this girl comes up to him. And after his show, she says she knows some guys who'd be interested in producing. And they were well known and asked if he'd like to meet with them. Hey, Charles. Yeah, Linda. How are you? Just great. Look, I have something important to tell you. I went down to the village last night to Café Wa, and I saw this extraordinary guitar player. I mean, he's out of sight. You have to see this guy to believe it. Oh, he was with a band, but it was as if those guys weren't there at all. I mean, he was doing everything. You name it, he did it. Look, Charlie, you've got to see this guy. Are you kidding? Charlie, you've got to see this guy. I mean, you've never seen a guy play like this before. I'm going back tonight and you've got to come. Please, you won't be sorry. He's so good. The show starts at 10 p.m. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll be there. Okay, bye now. So, you want to be a star? Say you've tired your of your desolate existence and your earnings haven't taken you far and you're tired of small time gigs. So you wanna be a star? Hungry years have turned to tears. Fast talking men put delight in your ears. You're using your talent to escape your fears. So you wanna be a star? Your rise to the top can happen any day. So is God in your plan? After reaching your goal, there's a long road ahead, young man. You're going to have to pay one day. You're going to have to pay. It's all part of the plan. So do you want to be a star? I'm a firm believer of the belief that we are all born for a reason. And God has breathed an innate affirmation into each and every one of us that we all have a gift that is given to us and that we must operate in that gift to find our true purpose and destiny in life. There are two important days in your life, the day that you were born and the day that you find out why. We are all born with a gift. In fact, some of us have many gifts and our gifts will make room for us. Well. I see life differently. You're born to have a free will, to make choices, surely, purely based on what you choose to believe, and to have the choices you make lead to the things we desire in life. Experience things in life with no regrets, realizing every step you make, right or wrong, will lead you to your purpose. Mistakes are a stepping stone to what you want and where you want to be and what you want to achieve. In other words, right or wrong, your choices in life will ultimately lead you to where you are meant to be. You don't need some voice hovering over you telling you what choices you are to make to live life. Just live life. Experience. Take in those things that allow you to be and feel free. Eat, drink, smoke, and indulge in those things that you choose to indulge in. Your inner voice will not lead you wrong. So... Jimmy, go ahead, live your life and deal with the consequences later. Oh, <laughs> I totally agree with that philosophy. The way of living as we all should know, or as the word of wisdom says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to destruction. The apple of his eye, tall, lean, black queen. Someone like him and always on the scene. From Minneapolis, she came to New York to make a name. Smooth, slick sister with game like razor's edge. She made him happy. She left him sad and loved him long into the night. The best she ever had, this mama was out of sight. A stone fox by all standards, a rocker's dream and well, 
She would rock you and roll you for a quick hit or two. Snow White dust became her obsession and while well, his, his black flesh became her king. And she'd end it all. One lonely night on the rooftop of a hotel, she plunged down to the ground. You think I'm gonna tell you that he didn't get high? You're wrong. The man got high, but he was no drug addict. He didn't shoot dope. He smoked weed and, and then dropped acid. But who didn't in the music scene in the 60s? It was said that the Beatles were stoned during the entire recording of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Band. That Jagger was busted once some more. I, I mean, you know the story. Anyway, I'm dead. I came to New York from Minneapolis to pursue a career as an actress and I dance and, and well, I sing a little too. But Jimmy is what you want to hear about, right? My boy loved his mother. Lucille Jeter, she died when he was young, about four, I believe. In a way, I, I think I remind him of his mother. She was a lively woman and she loved to party and drink. And, and she and Al, Jimmy's dad, well, they used to dance together as, as dance partners in various clubs, but unfortunately the drinking killed her and Jimmy never forgot that. And I remember he would, he would dream of her often. I met him in LA in 67. I was on tour with Quincy Jones, and well, we didn't start dating right away. We didn't start dating until 69, and well, Jimmy needed me because I could see right through the BS. There were those around who thought I was some kind of hanger on or some kind of grouper, but I kept them away. They wanted a piece of him to drug him. But with me, they I'd nip that right in the bud, you see. See, he was my lover, my friend, my protector, my provider, and, and, and he meant the world to me. And so we were just, there, there, there were those who didn't think we were meant to be together, but we were meant to be together. I mean, we would make love, oh. We would make love all night long, and he was just so hard, and he was just so gentle all at the same time. I mean, he was just magnificent. Jimmy, man, um, and he has so many fans, musicians, black, white, Asian, European, Miles. Miles was my friend who, who eventually befriended Jimmy. And man, he, uh, he thought Jimmy was just the greatest. And he wanted to work with Jimmy so bad, but his management, you know, his management just wouldn't allow it. And so, you know, they, they, they wanted to keep Jimmy in the rock category. Jimmy, man, Jimmy could play like, rock and jazz and blues and he could play classical music, American Indian, East Indian music. I mean, Jimmy could play it all. Man, people love Jimmy. I love Jimmy. Man, I just wish I could have shown him, you know, before he left. I just, I, I just miss him so. Jimmy! Jimmy! Jimmy, it's Devon, are you in there? Eight o'clock, come on, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Man, what? Wow. What? Wow. Jimmy, are you okay? Yeah, hold on. Hey, baby. You were great last night. You left the club early. Well, look what I got for you. Oh, she's fine, sweet young thing, just the way you like them, right? You gotta be kidding me. Well, I got this for you too. Oh, baby. Come back later, I gotta get some sleep. Oh, come on, you 
no fun. I got you some kid high. I got you this fun young thing right here. And you want to act like this? Look, the girl's cute. The drugs, I can get any time right now. I need some sleep. Let's go. Come on. Oh. Come on now, damn it. I need some rest. I've been up here three days already. Okay. Shit. You no fun no more, baby. You lost your pep or something. Come on, Cynthia, let's go. Look, look, look. Come backstage after the show tonight. We'll hang out, okay? I ain't no fool, Jimmy. I know you leaving town tonight. You ain't got no show. Did, right. No, I'm, mm, I'm so confused. I'll be back. I'll be back Saturday, Saturday night. All right. Well, all right, baby. Give Jimmy a kiss, Cynthia. Oh, all right. All right. All right. All right. So good. So let's go. Hey, I, I'll see you Saturday. Look, Jimmy, uh, can I get a hundred till Saturday? Oh, uh, no. I knew it was something. Good to see you. Bye. Come on, baby, please. I'll pay you back. Where are you going to get it from? Huh? I get money. And I got money coming to me. What you think I can't hustle? I, I know. Please. You Here you go. Two hundred dollars. <laughs> Thanks, baby. I'll see you around, okay? Daddy. What we do tonight? Well, I heard better, baby. You know that. Shit. I can't get it together with these guys. My music is messed up. It's not coming out right. It's not coming out right. I'm tired of Purple Haze and Foxy Lady. What? What are you talking about? It's going to all come together, baby. You know, you guys are just not used to playing together. See, the experience thing is over. And, and you trying this, this new thing with these black musicians. Now, this is what you wanted. This is your sky church, your band of gypsies, or whatever y'all call yourself these days. Yeah, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Well, come on, Cynthia. Look. Be easy on yourself, okay? Yeah, 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 I guess you're right. Stay groovy, baby. Stay free. Hello, uh, yeah, uh, Chaz, what's up? What rehearsal? You kidding me? Uh, no. I can't rehearse this thing, man. I, I know we're leaving tonight. We'll be tight. Let, let, let's rehearse when we get to Toronto. And come on. All right. Okay, two o'clock, right. Hi. I'm Kathy Etchingham. I met Jimmy about a couple of weeks after he arrived in London, actually. Say about October 1966. He was always a shy type and a perfect gentleman. One thing I remember about Jimmy, he had these incredible large hands. Such beautiful hands. And he used them a lot when he talked or he expressed himself in his face and whatnot. He liked my mouth. <laughs> he said I had sensuous lips, he would say. <laughs> yeah, right. 
<laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not fair. It's such a beautiful song. Yeah, no, it sounds like a get high song or something. Well, that's a drag, but these guys have been at this a long time. Uh, they won't steer you wrong. Uh, maybe you're right. So what are you doing tonight? Guys and I are just going to get together and, and go uh, see the moving sidewalks, uh, sit in, you know, maybe jam, you know, who knows? <laughs> So what's going on with the tour? Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna go on tour definitely. We're getting ready to go to Paris with Johnny Holiday. He's big there also with the Walker Brothers. Uh, this cat called Cat Stevens did that. This cat called Cat should be groovy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. Wow, sounds We got great. this new thing. We got this new thing. I'm gonna do what's, it. What's guitar. that, Jimmy? I'm going to burn it. You're kidding. No. At the end of fire, I'm going to burn it. Fire. That's a new song I'm working on. I'm going to going to take this thing way out. Not just the plan behind the back with my teeth and all that. We're going to do something different, you know? Well, that's really different, all right. With all this excitement, I guess I won't be seeing you around much. You'll be seeing me. I'm getting my own flat pretty soon. I'll be seeing you a lot. <laughs> Good. That's great. Then I can cook for you and, and put some meat on those bones. Can you cook? Sure, I can cook. <laughs> cook what? <laughs> British food? Bland. Bland. I can cook anything you want, like Chinese, Indian. Soul food. Soul food. Chicken, collard greens, cornbread, mashed potatoes. No, no, you can't cook it. Get me a recipe. I can cook it. <laughs> wow, Jimmy. Sing, things seem to be coming together after all. Your music, the band. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. But it could be better. There's so much more I want to do, you know? So much more I want to do. Anyway, let's blow this joint. We lived with Chaz, his manager, for a while. Then Jimmy got a hotel that was nice. But when the rally began to make some money, when we moved in this flat where George Frederick Handel once lived, he is the composer of the Messiah, among others. Anyway, Jimmy immediately wanted me to rush out and get music by Handel, and he loved it. He turned me on to the blues, he loved Muddy Waters, Elmore James, Howlin' Wolf, and B.B. King. He had all their albums, and I would listen to them with him. He also introduced me to soul food, which I'd never had. Things like fried chicken, smothered chicken, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, rice, and cornbread. He loved this, that stuff, and he taught me how to cook it. He had, we had so much fun together. We would go out to clubs with friends. Brian Jones of the Stones quickly befriended Jimmy, and he was over often. Brian loved the blues, especially Jimmy's rendition of Muddy Waters' song, Two Trains Running. He was so much fun. Always loved, to, loved telling jokes. He loved to laugh. He was kind of shy wouldn't quite look at you when he talked to you. But he was bold to have done all that and did. I, I mean, the way he performed, sang all the bold antics, you know. Jimmy talked a lot about New York and Harlem with the soul bands and stuff. The Isley Brothers, Curtis Knight, Jimmy and the Blue Flames. His girlfriend at that time was a black woman by the name of Faye, who Jimmy just adored. They dated during his years in Harlem he could never stop talking about his woman. They seemed to have such a loving friendship, which Jimmy felt it to be important to be friends. He mentioned how some of his best friends were women because they had helped him so much in his struggle to make it. He wanted, he used to call me Mary because my full name is Mary Catherine. <laughs> and he wrote that song, The Wind Cries Mary, for me. 
I love that song. He was the best, and I miss him dearly. After all the jacks are in their boxes, and clowns have all gone to bed, you can hear happiness staggering on down the street. Footprints dressed in red, and the wind whispers merry. A broom is drearily sweeping up the broken pieces of yesterday's life. Somewhere a queen is weeping, somewhere a king has no wife, and the wind, it cries, Mary. The traffic lights, they turn blue tomorrow and shine their emptiness down on the bed. The tiny island sags downstream because the life that lived is dead. And the wind screams, Mary. Will the wind ever remember the names it has blown in the past? And with a crutch, its old age and its wisdom, it whispers, no, this will be the last. And the wind cries, Mary. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Jimi Hendrix. Who do you think you are? You're no real black man. Look at you. Look at the way you dress. Even the music you play. You used to play soul and blues and now since you're playing with the white boys, you're playing that rock shit. That ain't black music. What are you doing for black people? You're messed up in a white world, man. They pimping you, man. Look at you. You have no control over your music. Man, you play what they want you to play. You, you are black Elvis, but worse. Brothers and sisters are struggling in the States and you're in England grooving. King is marching for black freedom and you're freeing your mind with drugs. Panthers are shouting, black power! And you have the power, but you're giving it back to the white man. You don't have any political awareness, my brother. I don't even know if I should call you brother. Nobody's listening to your shit. At least nobody black. Hey man. You better find yourself. Realize who your real friends are. Hey, stud. Man, you don't even have a black girlfriend. You better be yourself before you be by yourself. Well, she was walking through clouds with a circus mind running wild. Butterflies and zebras and moonbeams, fairy tales. That's all she ever thinks about, riding with the wind. When I'm sad, she comes to me with a thousand smiles she give me free. Take anything you want from me, anything. Fly on, little wing. Yeah, little wing. It's really hard to describe what was going on inside his head because he didn't talk much about what was there. We felt it and we saw it come out, but we never knew how it got there or how it manifested. I knew he was beginning to be more calmer, more expressive, more together toward the end of his life. There were a lot of things he wanted to change about himself, about the way he dressed, the way he talked. His music began to change and he was becoming more interested in film as an actor or producer. He began to be more concerned about money and where it was going and how he should invest it. He was trying to get out from under his um, manager's thumb, so to speak. He was trying to release himself from contracts he signed before making it. His new studio, 
Electric Ladyland was on his mind, whether or not it was successful, how it could be more interesting, how he could have more creative input into it, even though he practically designed it himself. He was becoming such a loving person, which he was always affectionate and perfect gentleman, but he was expanding beyond that. He talked about marriage and settling down and having children, even moving to England because he was tired of the hate and oppression in America. Not that it wasn't here, but not as much. He wanted to love and be loved. But somehow, although you knew he so desperately wanted to live and change, at the same time, you knew he felt his time was up. It was truly strange. It was like he was fighting for his life, but knowing he was moving toward his last days. It was like he had made a strange pact and his time was up. But he wanted to live so desperately. His one hope was God. I don't know if he asked for life or forgiveness, but his last poem was a story or a poem of Jesus. I believe he was moving closer toward a spiritual realm. And he was trying to find that savior, something, that freedom. He was in good spirits, um, a little upset about a disagreement with friends. So he went to a party to settle that. He had a little to drink, um, just fine. And he was known to take a few of my sleeping pills on occasion because he had a lot on his mind. A concert the next day, his life wasn't easy. There was a lot of pressure and it was just beginning to get very complicated. After all, he was Jimi Hendrix. An angel came down from heaven yesterday. She stayed with me just long enough to rescue me. And she told me a story yesterday about the sweet love between the moon and the deep blue sea. And then she spread her wings high over me and she said she's gonna come back tomorrow. And I said, fly on, sweet angel, on through the sky. Fly on, sweet angel, tomorrow I'm gonna to ride by your side. Sure enough, this woman came home with silver wings silhouetted against the child's sunrise. And my angel, she said to me, today is the day for you to rise. Take my hand, you're gonna be, take my hand, you're gonna be my man. You're gonna rise. And then she took me high over yonder, Lord. And I said, fly on, sweet angel, fly on through the sky. Fly on, sweet angel, forever, I will be by your side. Jimmy, turn away from the free spirit of experiencing and indulging into any and everything that your heart desires. Know and understand that what you connect yourself to and who you connect yourself to can lead you down a road of destruction. Every spirit you come into connection with is not necessarily a spirit that's right for you. As God is surely extending a road towards you to pull you in and away from an ocean of destruction. You can go so far out following your own free will that the rope breaks and you can't find your way back. Jimmy Poppycock. Yes, be free, be brave, be fearless, indulge, experience, embrace, allow it all to be free. Don't limit yourself. Go as far as you need to go to find what you desire. Don't do it, Jimmy. Don't believe it. Don't make that those choices. <laughs> Take my hand. You're going to be my man. And I'll take you high over yonder to the mountain top and beyond. I'm here to rescue you from those destructive choices. I want to spread my wings high over you to protect you, to release wisdom and the fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. 
take my hand and let's tra travel, let's fly together. I am the way to your destiny and purpose. Don't believe it, Jimmy. Follow your heart, follow your own way. You're invincible. You were born to win. Go for it. Go, go. If you fall or fail, you'll always bounce back. Don't do it, Jimmy. Look around you at where you are and the people you're connecting yourself to. Follow the way of truth and light. <laughs> Don't believe it. Come with me. I'm beautiful. Here is where you want to be. Come. See it as a beautiful woman. She's standing there, long, straight hair, curves round and abound, skin soft as silk lips, a honey sweet, rose petals around her feet. Her eyes are green, there inviting you into the open door of the tree. Jimmy? Jimmy, honey, you all right? Jimmy? Jimmy, come on, wake up. Jimmy, are you playing games with me? Come on. <laughs> tickle, tickle, tickle. Oh, my God. Jimmy, what's wrong with you? Come on, come on, come on, honey. Wake up. Wake up. Hello, Eric, Monica. I'm at my flat and Jimmy is out like a light. I don't know what to do here. Well, he hasn't had much. He just had a little smoke and some wine earlier, but... Well, I tried shaking him, but he won't wake up and... It seems like he threw up in his sleep. No, he doesn't have a fever. He's just a little cold. I'm worried. I don't know what to do. Well, I'm trying to wait and see if he'll come too. I don't know that Jimmy would want me to get the police involved. No, I don't think I should call an ambulance yet. Well... I don't know. He is breathing slightly, but he's just not moving. No, I am not calling an ambulance. Maybe he will come too soon. Well, he took a few sleeping pills. Eric? Eric, hello? Oh, my God. After Jimmy's body was moved from Samarkand at Lansdowne Crescent at Notting Hill Gate, there was a note on his nightstand, and on it was written a final poem, song, a story of life. The story of Jesus, so easy to explain after they crucified him. A woman, she claimed his name. The story of Jesus, the whole Bible knows, went all across the desert and in the middle, he found a road. There should be no question, there should be no lies, he was married very happily after, for all the tears we cry. No use in arguing at all. They're used to the man that moans when each man falls. In battle, his soul, it has to roam. Angels of heaven, flying saucers to some, made Easter Sunday the name of the rising sun. 
The story is written by so many people who dated to lay down the truth to so very many who cared to carry the cross of Jesus and beyond. We will guide the light this time with the woman in our arms. We as men can't explain the reason why the woman is always mentioned at the moment that we die. All we know is God is by our side and he says the word so easy, but so hard. I wish not to be alone, so I must respect my other heart. And the story of Jesus is the story of you and me. No use in feeling lonely, I am you, searching to be free. The story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye. All right, until we meet again, I'll give these actors a wonderful hand, please, everyone who have come in and joined in to hear them. Give them a wonderful hand from around the world. Give them a wonderful hand. How they've stepped out and claimed these words as their own and given you the life that was in this script and beyond. I'm so grateful for them. Before I call out their names for a final bow, I want you to hang on for the post show with Rosalie Brooks, the one and only Rosalie Brooks, vocalist and Hendrix historian, Nona Hete, uh, Hendrix photographer and photographer also of Parliament, Funkadelic and Sly Stone, and Corey Washington, a writer of three books on Jimi Hendrix, including Jimi Hendrix, Black Legacy. So stay for the post show. But before that, let me call these actors again, playing the angel, Gabrielle Lee, Gabrielle Lee is an accomplished actress and singer who has worked with the likes of Harry Belafonte, Marvel, Martha and the Vandellas, it goes on and on with her credits, Tina Turner, so many wonderful uh, singers and so many wonderful uh, uh, television appearances, films, and, uh, and theater as well. Playing Devonce. Nazipo Magdalene, an incredible actress who joins us from Los Angeles, California. We're so grateful to have her. She's at the door of one of the biggest breaks ever and we're just grateful that she had the time uh, to lend to uh, this particular production. Uh, had the pleasure of working with her at the Sundance Theater Festival in Salt Lake City, Utah and just so proud of the work that's beginning to come to her. Playing Rosalie Brooks, Sophia Coffey Loren. Sophia, Sophia. <laughs> There's only There's one. Only one. <laughs> God bless her. God bless her. From Chicago. From Chicago. Who came to, came to New York with the Jackie, with the Jackie Wilson show. Starring, no, starring Jackie Wilson. And she, and has, she been has been working recently, recently uh, uh, in the gym, clubs, clubs and school clubs, clubs and, around, around. and around. She's doing, she's theater, doing theater and she, and is, she doing is great things. And uh, we're so grateful for her. Devin, Miss Taranasha Wallace. Taranasha Wallace. What an incredible actress, born in Mississippi, but lives in New York. She's an incredible, credible uh, actress, and I'm so grateful that she had the time to lend to this particular production. I had the honor of being in a film with her uh, called Melinda with Lashans and Lydius White and Ross Coleman. It was a great time, directed by Marisha Phillips. She's also one of the cast members and just did a reunion of uh, Love and Hip Hop New York. So you'll be seeing her in the reunion of Love and Hip Hop New York. Uh, thank you, Taranasha. What a what a pleasure. Um, Monica, 
Ali Carey. Actually, Ali Carey plays Monica and Linda. Monica of German descent and Linda, uh, a British uh, a woman in the life of Jimi Hendrix, such an incredible actress. Most recently, Measure for Measure workshop in collaboration with the Public Theater at uh, Brooklyn College. And I had the honor of working with her in, in uh, Macbeth at the Old Globe in San Diego, California. Just honored that she and all of these actors would take the time out to lend uh, voice to these incredible, to these words. I'm honored. And they lifted it up as most actors do far and above off, off the page than anything that could have ever been writing, wrote. So I'm, I'm grateful for her as well. Um, uh, playing fame. <laughs> oh boy. Jenny Alia Morgan in the house. <laughs> Who has more energy than, than, than Jenny? No, Jenny or nobody. Jenny played fame, but the very interesting thing, we lost Miss Fame Prigian Pre in April and she had the opportunity. Jenia. Okay, sir. We had the opportunity to work. <laughs> we had the opportunity to. Uh, she had the opportunity to actually call um, uh, Fane and speak to her on several occasions, and uh, and she lent her talent to this production. Uh, not only to this production, but she was also in the production in collaboration with the Restoration Plaza in 2019. So we welcome her back, and she's versatile and incredible. Got a new film coming out. What's that film, Virginia? Well, the latest one is Catharsis. Catharsis. Thank you so much. And uh, and I'm so grateful that you joined us. Also, Kathy, uh, Christine Dreyer. Uh, what an incredible, accomplished actress. Uh, she continues to work as an actress. Um, she studied under Lord Richards. Some of you may know Lord Richards, who directed the re original Raisin in the Sun and was the uh, Yale uh, uh, Dean of Drama and also directed the first five plays that came to Broadway written by August Wilson. Uh, she also is an educator and attended New York University with two degrees. And uh, we're just grateful that she joined uh, the cast. And let's not forget our tech director, Rome Neal. Rome Neal, and somebody said the other day, who doesn't know Rome Neal? Rome Neal does a one-man Thelonious Monk, and he's traveled to Africa and just about everywhere. We're just proud and grateful to have Rome Neal. Mm. It's a part of, uh, as the technical director, he also uh, directed me uh, two weeks ago in the Jimi Hendrix Experiment. And me and Rome go back uh, for some time, even before, you know, books that we've had we done by Jimi Hendrix and Deloney Monk. But Jimmy uh, Rome directed me years ago at the mm. Theater of the New City when I played Jimi Hendrix at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we're grateful for him, for all the work that he's doing. <laughs> Out of the New Orican Poets Cafe, uh, there with one of his mentors, Miguel Agarin, and the incredible uh, company of people that still come to support uh, the New Oregon Poets Cafe and his monthly Rome Neal's Banana Pudding Jazz. Uh, you'll be hearing about it, and some of you already know about it, and some of you are probably here because of it, but we're grateful. We're grateful to Rome for lending his technical expertise and bringing the stream yard to, um, uh, to, to us and, and, and allowing us to stand on the stream yard. And, uh, and present this work. He's an incredible family man. His beautiful wife Sue and his uh, his kids, uh, three sons and one precious daughter who's also an Olympic uh, Olympic champion, uh, Leah Neal. Um, she's a swimmer who won several awards in the U.S. Olympics, and we're just grateful. So give the cast once again a hand, please. I want to right before I go into the post show discussion. I want to thank once again, uh, Dr. Mona Von Scott and Sean Von Scott at the um, Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, um, which has hosted the talents of uh, so many, uh, so many talents, Paul Mooney and, and Danny Glover, and just so many talents have come in and through 
their uh, particular um, theater. So we're grateful that they would give me the opportunity to uh, present these plays. This is called uh, a, a Trinity of Jimmy's. Um, and it's three plays about Jimi Hendrix. The next play up would be Jimmy's Slight Return. So um, we'll be letting you know about that as soon as possible. But we're grateful for the, Ber uh, the, the Black Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California, and uh, who saw the vision that I had and allowed a stage for me to present these plays. So I'm grateful for them. So let's give them all a hand. And last but not least, the brother who played Jimmy, Biko, Biko, Biko Eisen Martin, uh, did an incredible job. It's called Electric Lady, and uh, it's about Jimi Hendrix and the women in his life. Uh, I'm so proud of you, my brother. You breathe incredible life into this character, as all the cast members did. Uh, we, are take, we have an opportunity to, to take home something and learn a little bit more about this brother, uh, Jimmy. Um, and can, we, can we give it up one time for the writer as well? Well, thank, thank God for the writer. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> but but Biko, um, we did Stick Fly in Philadelphia years ago. And I, I just got the essence from him, from him that he was an incredible brother and he's an incredible actor uh, preparing for a play right now at the Rattlestick Theater in New York and just incredible, wonderful things. And most recently, a television series. What's that television series? Uh, 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 Modern Love. Modern Love. So look for Biko and continue to look for him because great and incredible things are going to be uh, coming uh, to and through him. And, uh, and about him, and we're grateful for everyone, the entire cast, and those who have uh, just been a part of this production. production. So after the closing montage, we will welcome the post-show guests. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. And let's give this incredible cast, technical director, and this incredible theater hand one more time, Electric Lady by Jerome Preston Bates. At the, at the time, uh, the cast of Electric Lady, if you could please leave the studio, you have links on your um, on your phone where you can tune into the post show. But as you leave the studio at this time, uh, just obviously the red 
that says leave the studio um, that would allow our guests to be able to come in. So thank you so much. And uh, and so now we welcome our post show guest. All right, Nona Hate. Thank you, Nona. Who else do we have? Uh, they'll be coming into the studio very shortly, Jerome. Here they come. Okay, thank you. Who else do we have? That's the one and only Rosalie Brooks. Rosalie. Oh, they'll be coming into the studio very shortly, Jerome. Here they come. Okay. okay, Rosalie Brooks is obviously one of the characters in this movie, yeah. and, uh, and she's responsible Rosalie for the soundtrack. The and there's uh, Rosalie Paul Brooks, Washington, uh, Hendrix historian. There's Corey Washington, Hendrix historian, and author of three books on Jimi Hendrix, including Jimi Hendrix Black Legacy. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this post-show discussion. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you. Pretty good. Thank you. How are you doing, Nona? Good. <laughs> hey. How are you doing, Rosalie? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank good. you for having us tonight. Now, Rosalie is in Los Angeles, California. Nona Hate is in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Corey Washington is in Augusta, Georgia, which... Happens to be my hometown, interestingly oh, enough. Right. Uh, Corey was born in New York. Now he lives in Augusta. I was born in Augusta, and now I'm in New York. <laughs> and what makes it so incredibly coincidental that we are both Hendrix fans, and, and he's a Hendrix historian. Obviously, uh, my history of Hendrix comes through my writing and of plays. Uh, but, but what was so shocking when I met Corey was that he taught at my high school in Augusta, Georgia, Lucy Craft Laney High School on Lanky Walker Boulevard in Augusta, Georgia. I just find that to be just mind blowing. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll present a few questions if you want to talk together while you answer those or perhaps you answer those individually as I come to you. Um, but uh, I'll have a few questions for you. And I just, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to come and be a part of the post show. Um, let me start with, um, I'll start with Rosa. Rosa Lee Brooks from Eudora, Arkansas. She's lived in New York, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, more than, than than half of her uh, adult All life. All my life. All your life. All my life. Has I've a beautiful been... family. And lives in South Central uh, Los Angeles, and uh, she's just a, a wonderful inspiration. Um, and uh, of course, you know, Rosa. As artists, we lend ourselves to a little creative license when we write these stories. I know. Uh, this story, uh, the Rosalie, uh, is about you. And as I heard it from you in the 90s, and um, maybe I added a little bit of the artistic integrity. In terms oh, of yes. <laughs> Most <laughs> definitely, but it was good. And but you know, yeah. I, I thought it gave more color mm -hmm. uh, to the story. And uh, I enjoyed the young lady who was uh, reciting it. Sophia um, Loren. Yeah. I felt like she was me. Awesome. <laughs> she really, she really embraced it. So my first question is about uh, the women in the life of Jimi Hendrix. And as I was doing it this time or writing it um, this time or rewriting it, editing it, I added a dimension was the battle for Jimmy's soul. I think we both, uh, all of us have uh, two voices, a voice that's trying to lead us to our destiny and our purpose. Mm -hmm. Another voice is trying to stamp out the light that so brightly shines through us. Right. And I do think there are challenges in those particular, uh, those particular entities that, uh, uh, that, that, that we are challenged with every day. But the question is, Rosalie, if you can just tell us just a little bit 
about you and Jimi Hendrix and when uh, and when you met him and uh, just fill us in a little bit more. We got a little something from this story, but obviously um, you you have you are so profound in your history, <laughs> and uh, it's just amazing. We had a, a few talkbacks in San Francisco and uh, New York and Atlanta just this week, and I just as I thought I knew you, my God, what mm. you have in you is just uh, it's just riveting. So if you can share just a little bit, I appreciate it. Well, I must say that you're heading, you're, you're, you're in the right direction when you speak on his spiritual side, mm. because he was definitely a spiritual walker. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. He believed in God. He believed that Jesus Christ was our savior. Mm. He believed in uh, humanity, uh, uh, right? And when, when, at the time we met, we all were going through um, a serious crisis. We had just had our president assassinated someone who we felt that was going to do right by the African American people for a change. Mm -hmm. And we were going to start being treated better in, in the life we live here in America, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was definitely on board with that, totally aware of the racism. He had uh, had a, a bout with some racism himself that he told me about when um, he was in the uh, 101st Airborne Division. He and my brother were together. Mm -hmm. And they want they were in their uniforms too. Mm -hmm. And they stepped to a hamburger stand trying to order hamburgers. And this uh, guy pulled a shotgun on them and called them the, the N word. And, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't run, but they, they moved quickly to get away from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that was something, a story that he had told to me. But like the man was very aware of the plight of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was a humanitarian first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and in order to be that, you 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 most definitely know the will of God. Yes, yes, yes. And he followed the will of God. The will of God. We're gonna circulate around the room just a little bit, Rose, and definitely, you know, we want to come back to you. And that president uh, that you spoke about, that was John F. Kennedy, November the 22nd, 1963. I remember I was in the third grade in Atlanta, Georgia. They rolled the TV into the room. We said, yippee, they got to show us a movie or some cartoons. Hmm. Little did we know the president was shot. And uh, uh, the, the, the nation was in mourning uh, for, uh, for a period of time. So it's amazing that you would bring that up. Uh, at a time uh, that you can remember that it was a standstill in so many ways. And uh, African-Americans at that time were still striving just to sit at counters and have a lunch at uh, the, the department stores. And Dr. King uh, had just recently did the, the March on Washington in 1963. So, uh, it was a, a time where in a lot of ways, maybe a lot of African-Americans lost hope, of course, and just people around the world. Uh, I'm gonna go to uh, Nona Hate. Nona, how you doing? Good. Good, I'm so grateful for you. And, and I know you're gonna share your wonderful <clears throat> books. And I know one of your books where you um, made a collage and, and, and you displayed uh, the, dip, the, the, the beautiful colors and the different uh, graphics that you added to, uh, as you photographed it at Madison Square Garden, I think in 1969. And, uh, and I just wanted to um, ask you, um, I know you had uh, an association with uh, one of the women in Jimi Hendrix's life. As a matter of fact, the woman that was with him on the night he died, Monica Daneman. Mm -hmm. And let's start there. Um, and um, and I and I talk, talk about that. Well, the my my idea with my photographs, I took the photographs in concert, but I put them away after he died. And in the mid seventies, I realized that 
I wanted to put more in the photograph than just him in concert. I wanted his music with so many, so many dimensions and so many layers. I was listening to Voodoo Child and I was inspired to go into the dark room and start multi-printing to bring more of the energy of his music into my initial pictures I took. So this led me into meeting people and doing my first book, Jimi Hendrix, The Spirit Lives On, in 1983. So I contacted Monica, and she was very cold and very put offish, and I was patient, and I said to her, I will never ask you anything about Jimmy and you, but you can tell me whatever you want to, but I won't ask you. And so she began to trust me that I wasn't going to, because everybody always wanted to ask her, you know, grill her with questions about Jimmy. Mm -hmm. um, so I honored her privacy. And so she wrote me a quote for the first book. And she was still cool. And we talk every six months and that. And then in, I think it was 1988, I get a phone call from her. I'm in New York. Come and see me today. I'm three hours away in Massachusetts. So I was like, OK. So I jumped on the next train, jumped in a cab, went to her apartment. And she spoke about Jimmy for about four or five hours. And I don't remember word for word, but I remember it was really mostly about his spiritual path, his um, teachings, uh, her about spirituality, um, and his connection with the larger universe, if you want to call it that. And um, it was... Uh, it was really wonderful. Um, I just went away with a, a feeling of a very intelligent, interesting man, besides being a great guitarist. Mm -hmm. And then um, next, we kept in touch. The next time we met was in Seattle, Washington, at the at a festival there. And I would say she was very etheric at that time, very almost not fully on the planet. I felt very protective of her. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I had I had a lovely connection with her. Um, like I said, we didn't get into gossip about Jimmy. We talked about energy healing and spirituality and that kind of thing, and that connected. And so I um, and then we both worked on our second. She was also my second book, Jimmy Hendrix: Reflections and Visions, and she wrote a longer piece for that. And she was working on her book in England at the same time. So. She would call me about, you know, problems doing a book, and we commiserated a lot about uh, the stress of, of, of creating books. Um, mm -hmm. And needless to say, I was really quite devastated when she passed. Yes, of course. And uh, I know that you saw me in a play about Jimmy Hendrix at Theater for the New City. Oh, God, it must have been back in the early 90s. And yeah. uh, I believe you communicated that with Monica, and she called me. Very interesting, yeah. and uh, I was like, "Wow!" I was, I was like, "Huh?" And um, and then I booked what my my one man show and and to tour uh, Holland, and uh, we went to Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and Tilsburg, and uh, she came out at the opening night reception, and uh, I was just you know Monica Daneman, but she was yeah. very kind. She took a few pictures with me, and uh, as I told you, she shared some letters um shortly after that but yeah so so tragic that uh um you know the consequences of her life i think i would lead that to people to to go and research that as opposed to you know yeah. uh, putting that out there now but i am so grateful yeah i'm gonna come back to you um um, um uh, nona uh one of the most incredible things about your work you're still there right nona yes <laughs> one of the most incredible things about your work is the collage of how you you add photos. I know the beautiful palm tree and the image of Jimmy, but mm -hmm. the one that was so powerful was kind of like that Harlem tenement in the background. Uh -huh. maybe, it was, maybe it was uh Central Park West or something. Yeah. And Jimmy's face is uh kind of glows out of that. That was very powerful. I remember I remember those photos from your earlier books. And I would Go ahead. No, no. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I always played his music in the dark. The dark room is a very magical place versus the computer, which I, you know, I mm -hmm. play on Photoshop now, but it's very different when you go into that dark room with the red light and I would play only Jimi Hendrix. And the one song I would be illustrating, if it was Purple Haze, 
then that's this i would just play that over and over and over again to get the most of the energy of the song to into try it. to put them yeah into the picture so um yeah thank you amazing 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 i think the very interesting thing that you and and rosa um uh, brought to this conversation was jimmy's spiritual life i mm -hmm. i picked that up in the music and uh and it made me want to discover more and obviously the writing of of jimmy Hendrix in terms of the uh story of life and of course a little wing and an angel and even some of the comments he made so um uh thank you for sharing that uh, i'll come back to you as well nona and thank you for being here uh corey washington my brother now we all know a little something about jimmy hendrix uh, here is <laughs> He's a bona fide historian, and uh, 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 you know, there's so many wonderful things to say of uh, you know about all of these guests. Um, but in terms of Corey, he has studied the life of Jimi Hendrix, and he's not even of our generation. I mean, in terms of the old folk like myself on this panel. <laughs> Corey, would you unmute, please? But uh, I'm sorry. Unmute. Okay, got it. Oh yeah, okay. But Corey uh, is, is, is a young brother who has studied Jimi Hendrix and studied also the black legacy of Jimi Hendrix. Because so many times that's left out, you know. I, I, Rosalie said a profound thing the other day in an interview. I think it was the one in Atlanta. She's, uh, somebody asked me, she said, so Jimi Hendrix, when he met, uh, when he got together with Buddy Miles and uh, Billy Cox, it kind of came back to... Uh, to his beginnings or who he was, you know, his true self, right? And Rosa said he never really left his self. He never really left. He was always there. It's in the music, uh, you know, the different beats and, uh, and the different tempos, the rhythm and blues was already there. Although he played psychedelic because it was of that area and that's the era and that was how he was promoted, it was still there. And it was always an element of a bluesman. Um, and I think Alexis Corner said the bluesmen are they're like preachers. Uh, they they uh, they they you know they they, they minister through their music. But uh, Corey, um, obviously you've studied uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Give us a little insight on in terms of Jimi Hendrix and uh, the women that he was associated with. And 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 it, do you think that's a significant? Uh, point of interest, you know, obviously my play spoke about that because I was a little conflicted about what I was being told about Jimi Hendrix and then what I felt and heard from these women. So in your research, and you've done some extensive research, can you shine a little light on on that and maybe some, some women that we, you know, obviously that weren't in this play or maybe some that most people may not know about? Right. Uh, definitely. Um, and when you study the life of Jimi Hendrix, you always come across women that were significant in his life all the way back to his mother, which was touched on in your play, mm -hmm. as well as the women that took care of him when his mother couldn't. The Jeters and the you know family uh, in California and Seattle. Yeah, you know, some of those people, right, are still living. Mm -hmm. And uh, just all through his life, um, you know, he touched upon it in his music, but you know, the for people, I think each of these women served a, a certain purpose. You know, Rosalie is the only one that I've really talked talk, spoken to extensively. Um, but, you know, as far as the other women that you had in there, I definitely would have loved to meet them. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in doing the research for Jimi Hendrix, you know, you always find these people, you know, it, you know, as far as uh, Devin. Uh, I mean, each one of these women that you – uh, encounter there's a shroud of mystery behind him and mm -hmm. you know a lot of different things that people say but you know it's always good to to see plays like this where you can kind of see a personal side of them and as you know like you said there was some embellishment but you get to see the, the softer general gentler side of their you know relationship because if you listen to some people out there it's you know groupies and and drugs and this and that, you know, it, it couldn't have been that all the time. So I, I definitely would like to applaud your play for bringing that out a more realistic side of Jimmy's relationship with these various women. Mm, great. And and Corey, if you can just, you've written three books I, that I know of, three books on Jimi Hendrix, and you'd really go deep 
to things we have not read in other books, which is interesting because I think the first book I read was uh, David Henderson. Yes, Corey definitely and David Henderson. And now it's, I, I mean, I saw him about three weeks ago at Rome Neal's function. And now it's, uh, and now it's called, excuse me, why I kissed the sky. But what, uh, why, what inspired you to dig deeper? And particularly in terms of the black lineage of Jimi Hendrix. And you just, and you, 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 you came up with so much. And I got the book at home and so much that you discovered and you unveiled and you, you present it and you put even spotlight on some musicians lives who may have impacted Jimmy in some way. And most people don't know, know about them, but what is it that inspired you to dig deep and eventually write three books on Jimi Hendrix? Well, I was born in 1976 in New York, as you alluded to. I grew up in an era where disco was kind of fading out and hip hop was coming in. So those were the two dominant uh, genres in my life starting off. But in New York, we listened to everything pop and, you know, Huey Lewis and the news, Cindy Lauper and all this, uh, as well as the uh, soul and Motown that your parents always have around the house and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. But something that was missing was Jimi Hendrix. He, he never was played around my house. None of my friends ever spoke about him. It was like he was non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got a little older, I would see clips of him burning his guitar or Woodstock. You never would see him around any black people. So I kind of like just, you know, shrugged him off. Uh, then later on, he was watching wrestling. I was a big wrestling fan. And this Jimi Hendrix song came on. And I was like, man, who is that? And I've been studying him ever since. And the first book that I wrote was uh, Nobody Cages Me, which was examining those questions I had, like why he wasn't played on black radio. And like you said, his music never left his roots. It was all funk, psychedelic, blues, rock, all rolled into one. He had something of everything. And then the, um, as I went on, I, I started to meet all these wonderful people, built my research up, and then it led to the first edition of uh, Jimi Hendrix's Black Legacy. I think you have this one. Yeah. And um, the latest one I have is like the third edition, which is got has a lot more information in it. And so, you know, there's just so much information that there's as Jimi Hendrix is one of the most complex, uh, interesting figures in the world, not just the United States. So, you know, we it's, it seems like we're never going to stop talking about him. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. And I love the photo on that last uh that last book there, and I'm going I'm to get my copy ASAP because that's in Harlem, of right. course, and we never see that. I think that was during the time he came to the 135th Street uh, uh, Festival and played. Right. Grant yeah. uh, Harper Reed is the one that uh, helped, that uh, got that photo for me, and uh, that was at the uh, before he did his press conference for that uh, Harlem concert. Mm -hmm. And that and, and uh, is this so because we don't see those photos of Jimi Hendrix. We don't right. see them. Where are they? And I remember when I discovered that photo maybe sometimes in the 70s or the 80s. And I was like, oh, OK. It was always something that kept me interested in this guy. I'm mean, like, and, and, and I think one of the most impactful things about his life, but it was three, three and a half years and he was gone. Yeah. And uh, and I mean, it, it went totally by my head because right before I, I lived in Atlanta up until about 16. And then we came back to Augusta and I, I spent my 11th and 12th grade at Laney. And so I was in Atlanta when he when he died. And I said, oh, that dude died. Mm. I remember him on um, Johnny Carson uh, with Flip Wilson, um, 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 you know, host. But uh, but uh, so grateful, man, from your perspective of Jimi Hendrix and and what you are uh, giving uh, readers who want to know more about him and particularly uh, about him from the lineage of uh Obviously, he's uh, an African American man. Um, his father was born in Georgia. I know you. I know you live in Georgia now, but uh, that's just a part of his history and that in that region as well. We're gonna come back to you, Corey. And uh, I, I really am honored that you said yes to be a part of of this discussion, Rosalie. Um, what? Um, why, Jimmy? No. Mm -hmm. Why Jimmy now? I mean, um, I'm going to tell you, I, I got to uh, uh, piggyback on what Corey mm -hmm. just spoke about as far as not 
hearing from him, seeing him, knowing about him, not pictures not shared of him with his own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That he, I'm going to tell you, let me get it together. Mm -hmm. Jimmy made, I talked to Greg about this, uh, and it's true. Right, right. You know, in West Africa, they practice voodoo. Of course, yeah. Jimmy made a declaration calling himself a voodoo child. Mm. When he did that, he was claim, reclaiming himself as a black man. Mm, 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 that's deep. He was, he wanted more than anything to have his own embrace him. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why he agreed to do the uh, Harlem UVA concert that was an all black audience. He knew he was being hoarded by other groups. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to show his own black African American family his what he could do too. His fame and his talent. He wanted that more than anything. And I'll repeat myself by saying he used to send people out to count the heads of his audience to see how many black people were in it mm -hmm. so he was when he started wearing changing his style of dress wearing his afro and uh being with uh including uh, larry lee and billy cox and buddy miles uh in his music uh and uh, he was admiring people like sly stone and the family stones and just really just trying to reconnect with his blackness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I tell you, I have seen a change. Uh, I met Jimmy's brother Leon in 91 when they gave Jimmy the star on the Walk of Fame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He came over and visited me, with me and we sat here watching video after video and we saw how exhausted he was because in that last year of his life that uh, he worked like a slave mm -hmm. he didn't have his itinerary was full i think he might have had a couple two or three days off but they worked him like a slave i'm telling you he was exhausted mm -hmm. and um the like i turn to leon i say we got to bring jimmy black mm -hmm. because um they were kind of like when black folks got into Jimmy, we all were into him. We listened to his music. We loved what he was doing, playing the guitar, Purple Haze, and all those uh, Hey Joe, and all along the watch. We and the Cry of Love album is one of my favorite albums of his, posthumously. But that is the best album. And don't and don't don't let me leave out uh, the band of Gypsies because he came full circle then, right? With with who he was as a musician. His music, as I was saying, never stopped being uh, R&B based. Any musician worth his salt will tell you. Mm -hmm. All of his music is R&B or jazz based. You know, what they call rock, you could hear it in the UT, mm. my song that we did together. Right, of course. And he takes that wild solo at the end and, and, and he had no sound effects on it. Mm -hmm. But he was playing all that screechy stuff and that's what they determined to be calling it rock. But if it was rock, you know, he got it from Chuck and, 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 and Little Richard, okay? Mm -hmm. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's all uh, from the same family. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to make sure that we get the, the you know we need our props we need our respect uh we're all we're i'm a, i'm an artist i'm going to be 78 years old if god say so in a few more days and uh i tell you we want to know we want to let everybody out there know we're tired of our music our talent 
are a gift only God could give us, being usurped, taken, claimed, taken to the bank, mm-hmm. and we it become the ignored ones. We're, mm-hmm. we're totally ignored in this industry unless you're singing about some trash. <laughs> you know, unless you're showing your body. When does showing my body have anything to do with my talent? Mm-hmm. I want to see that. Yeah. You know, I, I want to see some changes. I'm tired of you know. I don't. I'm tired of the talk, the neck, never negativity, the, the the all of these crashy things. We bring in my my partner and I. You know, I would say God don't make no mistakes when He brings His children together because I've been given a second chance with Greg Wright. He is much like Jimmy as I could ever, ever want. Mm-hmm. For in the the music, he plays it to the T. He's a great guitar player. Yes. He's 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 got all all the ingredients for success. He is going. I mean, you know, it's just the thing where we have some gifts that we want to bring to the table. And people are going to, I believe they're going to really enjoy what we have. And uh, it's about time. It's, it's about time. time. It's about it's time. time. And I know you, uh, as you're saying, you and um, Greg Wright are, are collaborating on uh, yes. on some music. And Greg has an album uh, coming out very soon. Yes, yeah, coming out. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he was waiting today for the delivery of the CDs, but... The album is called Big Dog Barking. Big Dog Barking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's for, apropos for him, okay? Exactly. And, uh, anyway, it's going to be coming out. We're going to actually have a, a launch party on the November the 6th. We're going to do that. Yeah. For well, his album, yes. Well, but, I, you know, he's, he's uh, speaking about Greg, such a wonderful brother. I met him through you. And yes. I just had a gr- the greatest time. Um, uh, you know, just getting to know him and uh, sharing stories. And he he spent some time in Augusta, Corey. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, he's been all over. He's been down in New Orleans and everything. And oh, yeah. Been, they love oh, him down in Jersey. They his love brother. him down in Baton Rouge, too. That's where yeah. that's, that's his stomping ground down there. He goes down there and plays a lot of the various clubs. They, they're begging for, clamoring for him to come back. And he's very well known over in Europe, too. Yeah, you know he's done a lot of stuff over there. You know they still got pictures of him up in the clothes and stuff. His brother is Wonder Mike from the Wonder Sh- Mike. The yes, Sh- he Sh- is from he the Sh- Sh- He just kind of said it casually. <laughs> <laughs> he's a man. He, all of his brothers. He has two other brothers. Paul, uh, his brother Paul, is a very, very, very good uh, photographer, mm. and they're all talented. Right, they, right. Each, and then uh, uh, Wonder Mike, yeah, he's oh my goodness, yeah, yeah, awesome. the whole the whole family is talented. Yeah, Jerome, no, I, um, excuse me, excuse me, Jerome. Mm-hmm. I think you should let it be known that Greg had intended to have his music included in this production tonight, which would have blew you all away, folks. Mm-hmm. Oh, can you play any of it? Blew you all away, oh. and that you, uh, the music couldn't be put in because his computer broke down. Oh. I mean, the modem went bad. Yeah. The modem went bad and he couldn't get another one until tomorrow. So um, you missed the it, treat with Greg Greg mm-hmm. Wright's music in this play tonight. It would have taken you, it would have wiped you out. Maybe we'll get it on slight return. Huh, bro? Huh, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, without a doubt, because he's been working with us. And initially, I wanted him to do it live. But yes, the yes. transition of it, I guess, over the internet and everything. But I, that was my first feeling for him to do it live. Yes. And, uh, but we are, um, he's just incredible. Thank you for, you know, uh, bringing that up, Ron. It was definitely on the tip of my tongue to mention. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he uh, supplied the music for the Jimi Hendrix experiment that we did two weeks ago. And it was just mm-hmm. incredible, his music. I just got to want to say one thing to Corey. Mm hmm. You got nothing but love from me, okay? <laughs> because you are bringing it, okay? 
every time you know when 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 there's a conversation regarding the truth you bring it yeah appreciate that Easy. and 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 that's what is needed all these I don't, you know, if you notice, I don't get into these debates with people on Facebook or any of those. I'm not in any of those groups either. Right, right. Because they have a lot of nonsense all the time. They talk about stuff they have no idea whether it's true or false. Mm -hmm. And I don't have time to waste. You know, I have other stuff I'm doing and it just won't allow me to just get involved in all that kind of stuff. Exactly. But, um, you know the, the confusion is ridiculous okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think with jerome what you did with the ladies uh in this play uh hopefully that it'll continue because it will shed light on him mm -hmm. as a person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just a rock star exactly exactly you know, as a person as a human being with with, with 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 frailties and with concerns and with love and with mm -hmm. respect and all of the ingredients that made him something other than sex drugs and rock and roll because that's the picture they painted of him yes yes and that's not the true picture of him and i'm glad for this play thank you thank you thank you rosa that means a lot coming from you and being yes. one of the uh, was just my label, Electric Lady. Obviously, Jimmy Hendrix had an album called Electric Lady Land. Mm -hmm. He had a studio that's still in New, uh, New York. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's built in 1970 and it's still there, Electric Lady. But I, um, so I'm, I'm just grateful. I wanted, I know we uh, may be racing against a little time right now. And I want to get back to uh, Nona and Corey uh, before we run out of time. Um, but uh, no, Nona? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, why Jimmy? Why now? And, and, and the spirit, the spirit lives on. And I think that what I want to say is that the most precious thing about having photographed him and being able to share my pictures is I have met the most amazing people of all ages, all uh, from all walks of life. People that you wouldn't think would like Jimi Hendrix. Sometimes would just come up and just bloom when they saw the pictures because it and trained them back into their experience of of either seeing him or or connecting with him so for me the people connection and and magical serendipity i'm not i don't have any hendrix on me and people walk up to me and say i don't know why i'm saying this jimmy hendrix <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's the spirit the spirit is my spirit, you know, which my love of him and my involvement in trying, trying to interpret his music in visual and help, help, you know, helping in that way, have the spirit live on, and then that connecting with um, people. So, in the future, you know, I hope you know this pandemic kind of interrupted things, but I was doing. Um, a pop-up in New York where an exhibit of my new work at the Funkadelic Studios in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, Don Orlando was wonderful and hosted me um, on May 18th, which is the day I photographed him, 1969. And um, I also want to do a fashion show. I'm, in, I'm doing fashion and I'm putting my photographs onto fabric now. So now out of the flat out, I'm going to be going into clothing, not clothing, but sort of I don't know. It'll, we'll see how it, it turns out. But um, yeah, the spirit lives on. The spirit lives on. Uh, amen. It's uh, it's it, it lives on. Thank you for that. Hey, Corey. Uh, yes. Why, why Jimmy? Why now? And why is he still relevant? Um, I mean, if you look at his music, examine his music, even the stuff that he did back in the '60s on the first two albums which some say is all lsd spacey and stuff i mean those lyrics still hold up people are still mm -hmm. talking about those lyrics um then you look at his stuff he did towards the end of his life which was pretty prophetic i think you even alluded to some of the lyrics from straight ahead you mm -hmm. know got to teach the the children the truth you know you don't need a whole bunch of lies mm -hmm. you know people are still quoting his lyrics and applying it to 
our everyday life. And that's really the measure of an artist and whether they remain relevant. So with that being said, Jimmy, Jimmy's lyrics were so powerful. They're uh, evergreen. They're, they're not going to get stale or old. You, you listen to some of the older 60s songs from that era and they are really dated, but his music is not dated. No, nope. the life that he lived, you know, was so full of life. And, and, and he's uh, just just an interesting person. I mean, we're still finding stuff out about him. Exactly. You know, I I I, I, I recently I, I, I was watching Jeopardy. And it was a Jimi Hendrix question on Jeopardy. Yep. <laughs> and I said, what? And, I'm, and of course, why not? You know, mm -hmm. why not? But that really uh, that really says something about the impact of Jimi Hendrix just across any border, any line, any, any uh, uh, culture or any race is just amazing. And just I have one more thing before. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's another issue the. I call it the final frontier almost, you know, Jimi Hendrix and his blackness, his black legacy. The reason why I wrote those books on Jimmy was because I, you know, David Henderson wrote his book, Greg Tate wrote a book, yeah, but yeah. the stuff that I saw wasn't being covered. The questions weren't being asked. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the stuff that I'm doing is still a lot of people that want to come out and say their piece on this so i think there's a lot more to go as far as like i'm doing the uh presentation in dayton ohio coming up in the uh beginning part of november at the university of dayton mm -hmm. and it's going to be talking about Jimi hendrix and the band of gypsies uh, pillars of funk the missing link mm -hmm. because a lot of people in the funk world don't give Jimi hendrix the proper credit that he deserves for influencing people like right. eddie hazel Right. Ernie Osley, he Ernie Os all these people love Jimmy. Mm -hmm. So he needs the credit that he deserves mm -hmm. and we're not gonna stop till he gets that. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there mm -hmm. you go. And like I, I, I agree with Rosa, you being on the cutting edge and on, on the forefront of telling the truth and 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 presenting, uh, taking the veil off of people's eyes and presenting uh Jimi Hendrix from that lineage, from you know what he, he was birthed into what he was developed from uh and uh so uh that is so incredible um i'm gonna start with you Corey, and then go back uh what next for you Corey? well uh, i'm still working on my documentary i took a little hiatus um mm -hmm. and hopefully i'll be coming up to some certain place i still got to come back to new york i know it's going to be a totally different world with covid and I'm gonna have to navigate a little bit differently, but I'm I'm gonna make my way back home, and I definitely have some people I need to talk to, uh, including yourself, if you agree to it. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, you know. Okay, and so that's mm -hmm. one thing I'm working on my documentary, mm -hmm. um, as well as it's something else. I'm, I'm I can't really I didn't get clearance to say it, but be looking for it in November. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm gonna say, and it's got to mm -hmm. deal with a radio show, and mm -hmm. so uh, I'll. If you're on, if you're hooked up with me on social media, you'll see it all over social media soon. Okay, I'll be I'll be tuning into it. And, I, and I, now that things are coming down a little bit before I go up into the next production, uh, I'm 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 gonna be calling you as well. And uh, and of course, people uh, can get your book. Um, uh, Nobody cages me. Uh, Jim Henry's Black Legacy, and the third one is. Well, it's actually uh, two editions of the Jimi Hendrix Black Legacy. That that last edition, I think, is the one you don't have yet. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely um, gonna get that. Um, Nona, what's up for you next? Um, right. I'm doing yeah more art, and uh, also I'm doing my visual autobiography of my 50 years of photography and photo art and fashion. Mm -hmm. which will cover everything from New York City in the in the 60s. Jimmy will be there and then uh, all the way through to current. And it's going to be called Backstories. So it'll just be the photograph of James Brown, say, and the backstory of how I got there and mm -hmm. um, uh, various, a lot of musicians. And it'll be really a, a nice way to organize my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, like I said, I'd like to do something in New York uh, next year. Um, at the Funkadelic Studio on my anniversary, May 18th. And also I'd love to see New York put on a multimedia like 
Yazid Manau put on a fantastic week-long Jimi Hendrix Festival in Paris in 1990. And every day of the week, there was a different Hendrix event in some part of Paris. Mm -hmm. So people came and kind of kept meeting in these different, all different types of music and concerts. And I would love to see something like that in New York that would gather together um, a lot of different Hendrix people and uh you know dances and music and visual right. yeah i think we could do it sometime awesome awesome well we'll be talking and we'll be looking forward to it and uh i know we're winding up and uh, i'm gonna go back to rosa because uh we're coming to the end of this program but thank you for having me oh yeah without a doubt thank you there's rome uh that's the uh i saw the um rome neil and and Barbara Lee, uh, one of the congresswomen in California, uh, gave us uh, one of the uh, citations, Certificate of Special Congressional Record. What's that? Certificate of Special Congregational Record presented to Rome Neal and Rome Neal. Once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Mona and Sean Vaughn for uh, for failing that particular honor, and uh, thank you for the congresswoman that, uh, that uh, presented it to us. And uh, it's an honor, and we're we're grateful. Uh, I think I want to go get some ice cream soon. Is that yeah, ice cream? Rosa Lee? Because it's so. Isn't that you, Rosa? That ice cream? Because it's kind of early out there. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> you hear that? Huh? Yeah, it's like uh, it's ten here, so it's like. Nine, eight, seven o'clock out there. There's probably still uh, sunlight out there. But Rosa, what's next for you? I know you said the music with Greg. Um, well, I know. I'm working. I'm working on uh, my book still. Okay. And uh, hopefully by the new year, I'll have it finished. Oh, good, good. Um, I had so many stops be along the way, but uh, I'm also working on an album right now, my own CD. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some really, really great tunes that I feel that the world needs to hear. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're getting that ready to present. And I'm still, I still have my band, The Brooks Project, mm -hmm. which consists of Greg, CJ, uh, uh, Michael and um, Kenny, okay. and uh, we are a resident downtown at a place called the Seven Grand, mm -hmm. okay. and we play there once a month. So we'll be there doing the 24th, the day before uh, before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and we'll be doing a, a definite uh, tribute to Jimmy that night. Awesome, awesome. So if anybody's in the location in the area, you guys come on. Yes, yes. I love to catch one of your shows. You know, I, yeah, not... yeah. You will enjoy it, you know, because Greg, you know, he can really bring it, man. I mean, really, really uh, beautiful. Um, um, he has, you know, he shows nothing but love. You know, it's in him. And the yeah. spirit, the spirit of Jimmy comes with it. Mm, without a doubt. Well, uh, it, no doubt he's an a incredible guitarist, a phenomenal human being, and uh, just honored to know him. And, and I'm, I'm wanting to hear more of his music. I'm one of his oh, fans. Yeah. All right. All right. He'll be happy to know that. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, he called me uh, during the show, and uh, so I'll be I'll be talking to him tomorrow. Well, right. just one last thing from everybody. Uh, if there's something you want to share before we close, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Corey. I just want to thank you. Uh, I think I alluded to it on uh, at your last event, the Jimi Hendrix Experiment, that mm -hmm. on September 18th, you know, I had my own event. I'm not yeah, going to yeah. pump it up here. But uh, both of us were doing something on September 18th. Yeah. You know, we did the little reverse track, uh, Augusta, New York Connection. Yes. Just doing it for Jimmy, you know, no ulterior motives. I'm not d getting paid all this money or anything. Well, I mean, I think we both come from a pure place of, of why we do what we do for Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's the most important thing. So I want to yeah. stress that and thank you to all the actors and actresses and 
uh, uh, Rome and everybody that's behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of the fellow Nona and uh, Rosalie, everybody, thank everybody. This has been a great experience. Well, great, great, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna go on to uh, Nona. Any last things that you want to share? Just thank you very much for having me, and uh, the spirit was on. <laughs> I think that's coming up into your house. <laughs> 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 thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy, for all the all the inspiration and all the beautiful, beautiful experiences that I have encountered through your energy, Jimmy Hendrix, and through the connection of spirit. Awesome. And Rosa, any any parting things you want to share with us? Any nuggets? I just want to right? tell you that he was right here with us tonight. Mm-hmm. Mm. You feel me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. And mm -hmm. uh, we keep that spirit alive. That's mm. that's our station in life, right? Yes, yes. Keeping that spirit alive. That's what we do. It's a positive spirit. It's a loving okay, spirit. Okay, and that's what we do. And we want people to know him. Mm -hmm. I mean, know him really, okay? Yeah. And not all the other fake news, as they call it. <laughs> yeah. Well, in closing, and um, and then I'll hand it over to me as he close it out. Um, I'd like to say that I'm just grateful. I thank you. I was 16 years old in Augusta, Georgia, in Delta Manor. I sit on the couch with my high school girlfriend. Her sister's... Uh, Boyfriend walked into the house with a bunch of apples. Mm. He had Sly Stone. He had James Brown. He had Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. And he had an album called The Band of Gypsies. Mm. I, said, mm. I noticed, I, I, I've heard about that musician. He said, man, you better, you should listen to that. And, uh, and I began to listen to Jimi Hendrix. And I, I just hadn't heard anything like it. And mm. uh, that's kind of what it started for me. I wanted to hear more. I went to the music store downtown Augusta, Georgia, and the guy said, well, you think that's good? You should go back to the, the original album. I, oh, I said, there are more albums? He said, he didn't, make, he didn't make before, but you should go back to Are You Experience? Yeah, uh -huh. And so, uh, and of course, there were some posthumous albums that was released afterwards. And plus, the smash hits make probably five in his lifetime. But, uh, and I went back and, uh, and, and, and continued to... Uh, to be interested in this. And I'm like, why he's not around? Why is 27 years old? What happened? And and uh, so that kind of started it for me. And uh, I began to write it. And I had a period of time where I put it aside and uh, didn't want to see it. And that was about a 20 year period. So I I thank God and I thank uh, um, Dr. Mona and, and, and uh, Sean. I thank Rome Neal. And I thank all my guests tonight, uh, Rosalie Brooks, Nona Hate, and Corey Washington. Uh, for lending to this conversation. And there will be many more conversations and I'm just grateful that they were here tonight. I'm grateful for everybody who has tuned in uh, from wherever you may be uh, for tuning into this one. The next one is called um, Jimmy's Slight Return. And it actually it's a slight return because that's the first play I wrote on Jimi Hendrix. So uh, we return back to that play and we'll let you know when that comes out uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future. So thank you once again. Before I turn it over to Rome Neal, who will close us out, because we are viewing this from the Rome Neal Banana Pudding uh, Jazz uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but once again, uh, once again, thank you. Put some Jimmy on and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and listen, because he's, he's 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 dropping some nuggets. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, and I'm grateful. Thank you guys. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. No doubt. Uh, Rome? Listen, uh, in the beginning, there was the word, and the word was with us tonight. And the mm. word will continue to be with us with Jerome Preston Bates as he tells the Jimi Hendrix story to each and every one of you out there all over the world. And all over the world, meaning you need to share this video on YouTube with folks that you know. Just send it out through your Facebook channel, wherever. And also, the, 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 the actual production that I directed last week was, was the Jimi Hendrix Experiment. So you can see it all on YouTube. If, if you missed the production, share it, folks. And we thank you so very much. Listen, 
Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Thank brother. Thank you for having the vision and staying with it and the remarks that you got tonight from the, the few people who came out to, to hear. Well, I think it was more than a few people. I think it was quite quite a many people mm. uh, that came that came to see us tonight. And you you did it, brother. You did it. You brought it on home. You did. It, you knocked it right out of the ballpark. That's right. I mean, with all the the mishaps and craziness, technically. That's and theater, right? And all <laughs> that, that it was the word. The mm. word. The word was with us. Mm. Those actresses and actors took those words and they just lived them because it came from the director, which you brought to them. You told mm. them what you wanted. Mm. Mm. Well, thank God. And I just say, God be the glory for the great oh, thing yeah. you've done, oh, yeah. for all that he's done thank in you my for life. The prayers. Thank you for the prayers, my brother. Yes, you asked sir. us to pray in the beginning. And I know you're going to close us out with a prayer now. <laughs> yeah, all right. I will. Well, you know, we, we thank God. Um, we thank God for uh, blessing us and keeping us and loving us and directing us. And uh, I thank God even from this uh, Jimmy Aquino um, studio in, in Brooklyn Heights and my friend and uh, assistant who's here, Miss Cambridge. And I thank God for our incredible cast. And uh, I thank God uh, for Rome Neal and uh, his generosity of spirit uh, for lending his platform to this. I thank God for Rosa and I thank God for Corey and I thank God for Nona. And for those who are listening tonight, may God bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he continue to give you peace. May he continue to give you direction. May he continue to open those doors in your life. May he continue to reveal himself as you move closer to him. May he continue to remove every obstacle for from your life. And may he continue to pour his blessing on you. May he be a light to your footsteps. And as you walk from your destinations to the places that you are ordained to go and the things that you are ordained to uh, uh, to bring forth. Remember that your gift will make room for you. If there's a gift in you, let it out. Begin to tell it. Because if you take the next step, uh, the doors will open and uh, you can take the next one and the next one and the next one. And those things that you have in your heart and those things that you want to be can be achieved. Just believe it and receive it and let God lead you. I pray for all of those that are listening tonight. May God continue to bless you and keep you. And we thank you for tuning in. Thank you. In his holy name we pray. Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Well, I've been blessed yeah. with you, my family. We need to come back with the UT. That's a bad song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right? The, the, the new UT, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah.